Thank you very much, Doron. Uh, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, welcome from Jerusalem uh, and on behalf of the National Library of Israel. Uh, my name is Samuel Frope, and I'm the curator of the Islam and Middle East collection uh, here at the National Library. And it is my great and distinct pleasure uh, to welcome our two distinguished guests this evening, Peter Cole and Eric Ormsby. Um, both Peter and Eric are masterful writers, poets and translators working in and through multiple languages. And so we've, uh, we've called this evening, Making It New, Medieval Muslim and Jewish Literatures Between Translation and Poetry. Uh, and the goal of our conversation tonight is, is precisely that. It's precisely to illuminate the connections between Muslim and Jewish literatures, between the medieval and the contemporary, and between the work of the translator, uh, and I should say also the work of the scholar, and that, and that of the poet. Uh, before we launch into our, into our discussion, and uh, before I introduce the speakers in some more detail, uh, I just want to take a few minutes um, of introduction and, uh, and, and uh, to sort of, sort of frame the context in which our event is taking place. So uh, first of all, it, it goes without saying uh, that we are still in the midst of a tense and difficult period here in Jerusalem. Uh, after so many in Gaza, in Israel and in the West Bank have been injured and lost their homes and their loved ones. Uh, and for that reason, um, um, particularly, uh, it's particularly important to me uh, that we express our thanks and gratitude to both our speakers for joining us tonight. Um, you know, I, I have to say that personally, I often struggle with the question of what culture can and should do in the face of conflict. Uh, and I think that translation uh, in the sense of a means of building bridges and creating connections between communities really has an undeniable role to play. Um, and I wonder if that's something that we can touch on later in our discussion. So I, I wanna say also that our mission here at the National Library of Israel is twofold. On the one hand, uh, we're the National Library of all of Israel's citizens. And on the other, we aim to be the library of the Jewish people worldwide. So in this rubric, uh, the library's Islam and Middle East collection, uh, one of the richest and uh, most important collections of its kind in the country, has a particular task. Using our acquisitions, our outreach, and cultural events like this one, we aim to serve a diverse population, including scholars of the regions, Jews uh, from the Arab world, Iran and Turkey, Palestinians inside and outside Israel, and Arabic speakers throughout the Middle East. We aim to make the library's collections, resources, and treasures accessible to all, in person and online, in Arabic, just as in Hebrew and English. Uh, and with the mention of these three languages, which are the, uh, some of the critical languages that we're going to be talking about this evening, it's really my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. So Peter Cole uh, is a poet and translator who divides his time between Jerusalem and New Haven, uh, where he teaches at Yale University. And that is where he's joining us from now. Uh, his translations include The Dream of the Poem, Hebrew Poetry from Muslim and Christian Spain, The Poetry of Kabbalah, uh, an anthology of Hebrew, Hebrew mystical poetry from late antiquity to modernity. So What, New and Selected Poems by the Palestinian poet Taha Muhammad Ali, and translations of works by contemporary Israeli writers. He's also the author of numerous books of poetry, uh, most recently the collection Hymns and Poems from 2017, and also with his wife, the writer Adina Hoffman, the nonfiction volume Sacred Trash, The Lost and Found World of the Cairo Geniza. His many honors include a Guggenheim Fellowship, the National Jewish Book Award for Poetry, and the Penn Translation Award for Poetry. In 2007, he was named a MacArthur Fellow. Eric Ormsby uh, is a scholar, a poet, a translator, and an essayist. Uh, he is a former professor and director of libraries at McGill University, and has also served on the faculty of the Freie Universität in Berlin and the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London. Alongside scholarly articles and books on Sufism and theology and philosophy, he has translated the, uh, the letters on the subjects of life, death, and languages, uh, which just came out. Uh, this is a translation of the 
Epistles of the Brethren of Purity, the ninth or 10th century uh, Islamic philosophical community. Uh, I'm sure we're gonna hear more about that uh, in a little bit. Uh, he's also translated the section on love, logging, intimacy, and contentment from the revival of the religious sciences by the 12th century mystic and philosopher Al-Fazali, as well as Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's East West, West Eastern Divan. His six books of poetry include his most recent collection, The Baboons of Hada, and his essays and reviews have appeared in The New Criterion, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and elsewhere. He's joining us today from Prague. So welcome to you both. Uh, Peter, Eric. Yes, thank you, Sam. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be uh, appearing with Eric, whose work I've admired for a very long time. Great. Uh, it's a pleasure to, as I said, to have you both with us. Um, so I want to uh, begin, actually, before we talk about uh, your own work as translators and poets, um, maybe to help our audience understand the connections uh, between what might appear to be different, uh, maybe even unrelated bodies of literature. Uh, so Peter, maybe I'll start with you. What does medieval Hebrew actually have to do with Arabic and the Islamic literary tradition? Well, the short answer is almost everything. Uh, a slightly um, longer answer would be that it wouldn't exist without it. And maybe to sort of put that in perspective or make it concrete, medieval Hebrew poetry from Spain, uh, particularly from the uh, Muslim period, is sometimes or has sometimes been considered by scholars to be a branch of Arabic literature, controversially. Um, but in, for example, uh, Cambridge University Press's History of Arabic Literature, Hebrew poetry appears in the Al-Andalus volume, in the Andalusian volume. So they're really intertwined. And why is that so? The product, the poetry itself is a product of a kind of inspired grafting of, on the one hand, a biblical Hebrew vocabulary okay. Okay. and a um, mythic a medieval Jewish mythic system. And on the other hand, almost the entirety of Islamic literature, certainly Arabic, the entirety of Arabic poetry up to that point. So pre-Islamic poetry, the classical poetry of the Abbasid period and of the Andalusian period as well. And with that, not just, um, not when I say all of Arabic uh, poetry, I mean, it's prosody, it's ideas of what a poem should sound like and what a poem might do, uh, its conventions, its genres, and most importantly, or not most importantly, but most, um, let's say, uh, scandalously in the 10th century, it's subject matter because it completely changed what he, the ideas of what, what Hebrew could do. Um, so all, and of course it's philosophy, the kind of things that Eric uh, has translated. Um, all that comes together in ways that today we might find kind of impossible uh, or ludicrous even, uh, but it happened and it produced an amazing uh, body of work. Uh, so I, I love the I love the idea of scandal. I love, I love the scandals. <laughs> um, but, but before we get to the scandalous part, Eric, uh, hello and welcome again. Um, so I I wanted to put the same question to you, and I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, so we're talking about um, how it might appear to be unrelated bodies of literature that you worked on, and, and especially for you as someone who's translated from Arabic, translated from Persian, and also translated from German, uh, both medieval works and modern texts. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, how is Arabic philosophy connected to Persian mysticism? <laughs> well, that's a big question. That's a big question, Sam. But let me first say how delighted I am to have been invited to this event with you and Peter. And uh, uh, well, for me, it's a kind of virtual pleasure because I haven't been to the National Library of Israel for many years. But I well remember uh, my visit there and meeting with Malachi Beit Arieh at that time. Uh, that tells you how long ago it's been. 
but um, uh, well, of course, I, it's it, that's a big question you ask, and uh, uh, a lot of the Persian poetry that I know, at least, is infused with the philosophy, and particularly uh, after the after the uh, coming of Ibn Sina, who uh, had a huge influence uh, not only on philosophy, uh, perhaps the major influence in Islamic history, but also on the thought that made its way into the poetry and a kind of uh, amalgamation, amalgam of Sufism and philosophy that occurred in later centuries. So the philosophy is very much there. And of course, you'll find poets uh, spouting philosophical adages, but it's hard to know whether this is just persiflage or whether they really, uh, I mean, of course, they were philosophical poets, but uh, I would say they tried to, the poets that I'm familiar with anyway, tried to encompass all the culture of the Islamic world at the time. And uh, not only the Islamic world, I mean, you find uh, men you know, mentions of quotations from the Hebrew Bible, from the Christian scriptures. Uh, and of course there were Christian poets writing in Arabic as well as, as, well as Hebrew, Jewish poets. So uh, it's a little hard to, uh, to be more specific than that at this point, but uh, I would say it's, it's all part of the same cultural uh, uh, milieu and the cultural outlook of it. Well, I, mean, it's, I, I can't hear you very well. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay, so I'll do this. Um, it's all part of the same cultural milieu, but but that's a cultural milieu that's very far from the one where you grew up. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> well, many, not really, Sam. I grew up in Florida in Coral Gables. And all the street signs had Arabic and Andalusian names. So I think, you know, you had Alhambra and so forth. Uh, and I think those place names that I saw daily riding my bicycle may have somehow influenced my interest in this. <laughs> and of course, the architecture was a kind of pseudo Moorish. So, uh, you know, I feel as though in a way I grew up in a kind of um, ersatz Islamic city, you know. <laughs> That's, that's not the way I often think of Florida, but, uh, but how, did, how did you then get involved uh, as a scholar with this material? How did you come to, to work on? Uh, well, on it's kind of a funny story. My wife, my, my late wife, my ex-wife was uh, an Assyriologist and uh, studied at the University of Pennsylvania where I went to. And uh, as part of her course of study of Akkadian and Sumerian, they required her to take Hebrew and Arabic. And I would help her with her homework, studying the vocabulary. And I became intrigued, but I had studied Hebrew for several years, but uh, for some reason, the Hebrew summer course was canceled and they offered Arabic. And so just by chance, I took this and I became totally fascinated by it. Uh, and of course, once you start learning the language, you, that's just the first part, you have to learn something about the culture and the history and so forth. So, uh, but I must say on a more personal level, it was always the sound of the language, the Arabic language in particular, that um, not only fascinated me, but enchanted me. And I think had a kind of influence when I began writing poetry, this very intricate patterned uh, language with its unusual uh, combinations of consonants, its long and short vowels uh, was somehow floating in the back of my mind, even when I was writing poetry, not that I uh, write in Arabic, but um, that possibility of a kind of intricate patterned language um, was very important to me. Peter, is that, is that something you can relate to? Uh, not to the Florida part. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know about that sort of trickle down, that trickle down or sort of the osmosis, because I actually began seriously translating this work um, after a trip to Portugal and where I had to take a train all the way across to get out, to, to get a flight. I had to go to Barcelona, took the train across the Iberian Peninsula, sat in the observation deck, didn't have a, an Andalusian thought in my head, trust me. And yet when I got back, I was living in San Francisco then, something happened. But anyway, to go, I'll go back a little bit. It's inter uh, I do relate very much to what Eric said about the sound. Uh, and that also goes back to the scandal of uh, 10th century uh, Iberia, where we have records of um, Christian writers and church officials complaining of uh, that all the, all the young Christian men are in love with the sound of Arabic uh, 
And that's all they want to do is write in Arabic. And the same thing really happens in Hebrew. It's the sound, and we also have records of this. It's the sound of it that really drew people in, that it comes through the ear and reaches the, the soul that way. Um, so, and I, I think it had a, a, an effect on my work in a similar way, but that's, that's getting ahead. Um, how I got to Hebrew and all this, I really came back to it. Um, I had gone to Jewish day, day school um, in Patterson, New Jersey. I had, you know, the sort of rudiments of a Jewish education. Uh, had more Hebrew than I realized I had. But anyway, I forgot it by the time I was an adolescent. And for purely literary reasons, uh, I wanted to come back to Hebrew. Uh, I wanted to find out, I was very interested in the idea of the history of English poetry as a Judeo-Christian literature, which it is, marvelously so. And I certainly love the Christian part of it, uh, but I didn't really know a whole lot about the Judeo part of it. And what I did know wasn't really helping me uh, very much in my uh, explorations. And so uh, all kinds of, it's always coincidences, who you meet, a conversation, a chance encounter, the Hebrew course was canceled, right? Uh, I worked at the Holiday Inn in Providence as a maintenance man. They were, I was grouting bathtub. They had Bibles in every room. I would take my break. I would read the Bible. I was interested, you know, things like that. But I ended up coming to Jerusalem um, to do the, the Ulpan at Hebrew University. In those days, it was Givat Ram, down the, you know, just down the campus from where your office is, Sam. And not where you are now, but where your, your day office is. And I... I threw myself in, um, it was, it, the whole project was fueled by the fact that my younger brother was killed two days after I got to Jerusalem. And so I went back to the States, the funeral and Shiva and decided, the family decided, no, you go back to, to Jerusalem. And I studied with a kind of sense of mission and seriousness that I had before, but not quite the same way. Um, and one of the first things, medieval things I encountered was, well, first of all, I was introduced again through all kinds of people um, to a, an Israeli, a, a new friend, an Israeli student, uh, Gidi Nouveau, many of you in the audience probably know him, writer and professor at um, Be'er Sheva. And he brought me along to, uh, to his classes in, in medieval Hebrew poetry at Hebrew University. And I was sort of just out of Ulpan, but my Hebrew did come back pretty pretty quickly and strongly. Um, and one of the things he said when he saw, when I you know, confided in him that I was in fact in mourning, was he said, oh, you should read the poems of Shmuel Hanagid, uh, his elegies for his brother. And that became my goal. And when you have that kind of goal and motivation, uh, I'm sure many people out there have had that experience, your desire does strange things like the mother who can lift the car uh, when the kid is cr uh, crushed under it. And I learned, and it, I, that material, the Hebrew poetry, I also took classes in Yemenite poetry, all that, it kind of cracked me open as a poet. And I was 21, 22, I think I was 22, 23 then. It cracked me open as a poet, and into those cracks came this new way of writing, this new ideas of what poetry could be, this new sound that Eric talked about, um, these new ways of, um, of, of using quotation, of, of being derivative and creating something incredibly fresh from these strange graftings that I mentioned. Um, and I didn't actually translate, I did translate a little bit and my friend Giddy said, you better not show that to anybody. And I didn't, I put it in a drawer. But 10 years later after that trip to Spain, uh, I began, it just kind of erupted volcanically. And I, I understood that I, now understood something about how I might translate the stuff that was really exciting me in this poetry. And I really just didn't stop. I just kept going with that. So um, similar and, and, and dissimilar. Mm -hmm. the, um, you know, this idea of sound, the sound of a language is something that's, that's so attractive and so uh, kind of enrapturing, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to communicate if you don't speak the language. It's very hard to understand even. Um, and one of the things that, that most, I mean, because I've translated a bit myself, and one of the things that I most find difficult as a translator is 
is conveying that aspect, right? It's conveying this, this music of the language, which really, if you're moving from, especially from Arabic, Persian, Hebrew to, to English, is, is extremely hard to do. Uh, and even in a broader sense, I mean, trying to, I think, render texts uh, from the Islamic cultural sphere into contemporary English. I mean, it presents it presents numerous challenges. And reading your work, I've been so impressed by how you both managed to uh, to succeed to, how you succeeded to do that. How how the translations themselves sound so right and so at home in the English language. Um, so I'm I'm curious, uh, sort of how you both would define the the major problems that that come to you when you encounter a text for translation um, and also how, how you try to overcome those uh, difficulties uh, and I would love it also if, if you'd like to if you could both read uh, maybe from an example of your work an example of the, the translation that you've completed um, maybe maybe Peter we can start with you okay um, so the major problem the major problem is talking about problems. I, pre I prefer to start with uh, enthusiasms and things that I love and um, that I feel are possible. Um, problems are everywhere, right? If I, there are a lot of things I can't do in life. And if I start to list them, the number of participants will go down very, very quickly. <laughs> um, but if I start to talk about as now, the things that I love to do and I think are possible, well, they'll at least hold on to hear what those might be. Um, and that's sort of the way I feel about translation. I have a poem um, uh, which starts out, I'm, it's called I'm Being Partial. It starts out, I'm partial to what's possible, he thought, not the ineffable. And it's a poem about translation. And I went back as I was writing that, I, it should be I'm partial to what's possible or I'm partial to what's impossible. I kept, you know, I couldn't really figure out which, which one it should be, but it really is, I'm partial to what's possible. What can you do? And um, um, so the first thing, and when I teach translation, which I do, is I always tell students focus in on the thing that really struck you, the one thing that if your life depended on it, you would fight or something close to that, you would fight to bring over to get into English. Frederick Schleiermacher was one of the great uh, theologians and theorists of translation, um, writes about what is it, uh, what is the beauty that has pierced you in the original text that you want to account for? And when I say beauty here, when he says beauty, it includes ugliness and it includes complication and politics and all of that. That's part of the beauty, right? the, the kind of uh, crazy mad beauty of it. So. I first focus on that and do my best to, um, to bring that over and find ways to do that. Now, what are the problems in doing that? Of course, love and problems are uh, always hand in hand. And um, specifically with the medieval um, Hebrew poetry, which is, as I say, very much an Arabized poetry. I think one of the first problems I encountered was uh, when almost everybody that I read or even just heard talk about this poetry, they talk about it as being ornamental. And if you are a poet, growing up, becoming a poet uh, in the 1980s in America, late 70s, early 1980s, ornament is bad, it's bad. Especially, you know, I cut my teeth on the modernists, those are my heroes, like nothing could be worse. Ornament is crime, as Adolf Luce, the, uh, the uh, Viennese architect's uh, version of that, or comment on that famous essay. And so what are the ornaments and what are the rhetorical, the verbal ornaments? How do you deal with that? And I really didn't know because I said to myself, I don't like ornament, but I love this poetry. And everybody says this is ornamental. So I don't understand what ornament is in poetry and how, and I should find out. And I began just reading widely, talking to art historian friends. And <clears throat> I was taken to uh, a man, Oleg Grabar, who's one of the great art historians of the 20th century who wrote about Islamic art and uh, the idea of arabesque. And he has a book called The Mediation of Ornament, which was really, really important for me. And that helped me understand what the verbal equivalents of, of these visual ornaments that I did love are. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, there was another, another problem is uh, 
the poetry is constructed, the Hebrew poetry is constructed entirely from a kind of collage of broken up biblical vocabulary and verses. And what do you do with that when you're translating into a culture where not only do people not know the Bible, they probably don't like the Bible. If you tell them that's the Bible, they're going to say, I'll, I'll prefer, I prefer to read Chinese poetry, you know. Um, <laughs> so that, there's that. I'm not going to say how we dealt with that. It took a little while. Um, and then there's the presence of the Arabic and the grafting. Anyway, all those things, uh, all those things went into it. But the, the principle is to, to start with, with affection and affinity and the feeling of contact and contagion and be, be, that's what I'm trying to do justice to and be, be faithful to. And, you know, there are ways, <laughs> everything ripples out. If you, if you have a kind of informed instinct and that continues to build and, and grow. And I wanted to know everything about that culture which also eventually led me to Arabic. I don't know everything about their culture, obviously. There are many people who know much more, but the more I knew, the more I found a way to feed it directly into that switch that moved to English. And as you said, I, I, then, then it has to become a, an English poem and you, you, know, you have to test it on its own terms. Um, so a lot of work. Is there something that you'd like to read? Oh, right. Okay. So I will, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I will read a poem by Ibn Gabi Roll, um, since he's already come up and he's in fact, uh, philosophically related to a lot of the things that Eric has been translating. Um, I'm going to read a poem uh, that, find it here. Um, I give it the title in English, I love you, uh, which they don't have titles in the, in the Arabic. Uh, this one has a Judeo-Arabic uh, superscription or caption uh, in the manuscript, which says that he wrote that this poem, we don't know the providence of that um, caption, but uh, Ibn Gav uh, the, uh, the caption says that he, this poem is an answer to a student who asked about the nature of existence. So uh, it's, but it's also a, a poem about a transferential or translational situation, teacher to student, what does the student do? I love you with the love a man has for his only son with his heart and his soul and his might. And I take great pleasure in your mind as you take the mystery on of the Lord's act in creation, though the issue is distant and deep and who could approach its foundation. But I'll tell you something I've heard and let you dwell on its strangeness. Sages have said that the secret of being owes all to the all who has all in his hand. He longs to give form to the formless as a lover longs for his friend. And this is maybe what the prophets meant when they said he worked all for his own exaltation. I've offered you these words. Now show me how you'll raise them. <laughs> So that there's all kinds of Greek Islamic thought funneled into that and Gnostic stuff and Platonic stuff. I mean, it's all there, but it's boiled down in Ibn Gabriel to this incredibly tender, charged, loaded, complicated moment of the teacher and the student uh, with an erotic dimension um, that's also complicated. And, and I know that, I know that moment. And I've read this poem to students in <laughs> awkward uh, poetry reading sometimes, um, but yeah, I believe in this and, and I wanted to make it come alive in English in any way that I could. And, and what I have to say, what I love about that is not just the, how there's this dialogue between the philosophical level and the, the lived sort of emotional experience, which I think a lot of us can connect to, uh, but how it doesn't sound, it, it doesn't sound like a translation at all. I mean, it sounds like thank you. Like that is, is coming directly into this language that we all speak and we all share together. Yeah, I think one thing is back to the ear that Eric mentioned at the beginning. You know, I'm also very much writing for the ear. This is a very abstract poem. There's no, there's very little in the way of imagery. So the only thing holding it together is the weave of the consonants 
and the vowels and, and the pauses and all that quantitative stuff, that feel for, for cadence that, that uh, Arabic and medieval Hebrew, I think are both good teachers uh, of or instructors in. Um, but I say, I say my translations aloud, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of times. I live with them. They're in my sleep. They bother me in my sleep. They bother me still. <laughs> you know, they, I just, the, the pulses, I can, I can remember them percussively, even when I forget the words. And so that's, that's the same as original poems. And that's why I try to get to that place where it becomes, the translation becomes a very physical thing in my body, in my mouth, pulsing. So, uh, so Eric, I want I want to turn to you. Okay. Uh, well, I think Peter's wonderful translation of that poem uh, is an answer to your initial question about philosophy and poetry. Uh, this time in the Hebrew context, but uh, you know the uh, some of the Islamic philosophers in the Middle Ages uh, make this interesting distinction between words and meanings, and they say the words are the physical body, and the meanings are the spirit that invests it. And of course, as translators, we're stuck with the body. <laughs> but I welcome that. I mean, to me, that's a joy because uh, what I said earlier about the different sound patterns. And yet the paradox for me is that what most draws me to that Arabic poetry is what exactly what cannot be conveyed. You know, the actual sound. Uh, when you take a line by, say, Al-Mutanabbi, where he says... Uh, you know, this little phrase, you know, this is a packed, charged pair of words. And there's, I don't know of any way to convey that. Uh, I mean, of course, the meaning is simple. It's the stirring of a woman in the darkness uh, uh, reveals her because she is musk and her progress uh, in the night because she is a radiance. You know, well, so, you know, this is not terribly overwhelming content, but the sound, you know, that you can almost hear the rustling of her skirts as she walks through the darkness. How to do that in, in I mean, the problem is English, really. <laughs> not Arabic or Hebrew, uh, but uh, I found a way in this. I'm not really a translator of poetry. I've tried to do it, but I haven't published it. Uh, mostly, uh, most of my translations from Arabic and Persian or other languages have been of prose works. Um, but I found a, a different way to do this, just to make kind of versions based on uh, the original poems. Not necessarily literal or even very accurate translations, but versions of the poems which tried to capture something of the original. Uh, and I later learned <laughs> that this is what Goethe did too, when I was translating his East Western Divan, he would take everything, you know, prose works uh, in Latin or German, because he didn't know the original languages really very well, uh, and make poems out of them. And uh, that seemed to me one way that this problem could be solved, or not solved, but at least addressed. And uh, if you'd like, I'll read one of those uh, poems that uh, kind of takes off from an Arabic original. I, I would I would love if you could read it, uh, especially. I think I think so in fact. I'm so I, I would love if if you could read it because I'm so fascinated by. Uh, I think in fact, a poem you asked me to read. Please, please. <laughs> this is called "A House in Winter," and it's by a 10th century uh, poet named Asanaubari, who was famous for uh, what is called in Arabic "wasf" description. His poems would dwell on descriptions, often a very humble, homely objects, but with a great deal of ornamentation, to quote Peter, uh, which reminds me uh, another, of another art historian who I found very influential, that was Joseph Rickwert, who wrote a book called The Necessity of Artifice, uh, which seems to me <laughs> in a way to sum up a lot of what goes on in, the, in this poetry. Anyway, a house in winter. Winter sweetens my house with its scent. What could be better than a winter sweetened house? In platters heaped with food and in my good roof, in snug cushions, in drapes brocaded with dark, I find continual pleasure against the cold. And there's pleasure also in the courtyard pools where their elegant purling meander through gardens of grace 
especially on days when the sun dimming clouds hammer against my walls and the drain pipes voice thick with slush struggle to mimic the long necked mandolin. Then from inside my house, I watch other low hanging clouds, pond mesmerized, whittle dim stemmed flagons with their subtle waves. On evenings in my winter sweetened house, the cup which the boy, fawn diffident, displays apparels carnelian wine in winking crystal. I adore the strands at his temples and his brow where musk has darkened his hair until his face shines out at me like, a, like the moon on a night of snow. God has given the measures of winter and of summer. You will not augment them with all your scurrying. Treasure your moment in this winter gentled house. Thank you. Very and of course, this also, as Peter noted in his own in his own translation, there's a uh, erotic motif, of course, uh, the, the the boy, the fawn like boy. You know, <laughs> they're almost always boys. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's that's part of the scandal that <laughs> maybe yeah you know, yeah. Although it's funny that what was allowed in poetry uh, was disapproved in in life. Of course, you know, wine drinking, uh, the love of beautiful boys. <laughs> but uh, these are some of the main themes, and it's very interesting that that erotic element is transposed into the Hebrew verse of the period too. So I, before, I want to talk about Goethe and about your translation of Goethe, but I also uh, want to ask you about prose because you've translated some of the most uh, complex works of philosophical prose. I mean, the the Akazali and the Echon Asafa. How do you how do you approach these texts? Because they're, I think your your translations are remarkable for how approachable they they exactly are. Well, they took me a long time. The Hazali took 11 years. And that's partly because somebody stole my computer with all my files and I had to do the whole thing again by hand. <laughs> but um, uh, I, again, it's this fascination with the way in which they express thoughts. Uh, the, uh, I wouldn't want to say poetic, but it's often lyrical. I mean, Hazali has a strong lyrical, although as far as I know, he never wrote poetry, has a strong lyrical quality to his prose, which he deliberately used because he wanted to draw readers in. He was a great proselytizer. And uh, the Persian writer also, uh, who is actually a great poet, Nasir Khosro in Persian, uh, as, you, as you well know, I'm sure, <laughs> uh, uh, sort of transformed Persian prose. And again, in both cases, Ghazali and Nasir Khosro, they were something of innovators in the creation of prose in their respective languages. And that was a kind of, that appealed to me as a challenge, you know, and also it made them more feel closer to me, you know. Uh, I mean, I've also worked on strict uh, uh, scholastic theological texts, and that's not as pleasant to do. <laughs> Although it's an interesting challenge to try to make something like that interesting and accessible to a modern reader. But Ghazali is easy in that sense, because he write, he's deliberately writing for readers. You know, he's, uh, he's not just off in some lofty sphere uh, contemplating things. He's very immediate and direct and, again, very physical, uh, you know, in his uh, use of language. So that's always what appeals to me, this paradoxical thing that what I can't convey most attracts me. <laughs> Which is also Goethe, right? Goethe says, when translating quest towards the untranslatable. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, he was very interesting in that respect in that, of course, he, he would, could really be called an Orientalist for over 20 years. He pursued these studies, I mean, with the main scholars of his day, and um, uh, they would send him their books. And of course, all of his versions of Hafez, for example, are based on von Hammer's German translation. But, you know, he was kind of a magpie and uh, he would read something in a Latin translation from a historical chronicle. And then he would turn it into verse. And one of the most powerful poems in his divan is a poem in which the winter, the season of winter, 
speaks to the conqueror Timur, you know, and uh, really gives him hell. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, but Goethe took that, took that from a chronicle, a prose chronicle that had been translated into Latin and just arranged it as verse. And he does this a number of times in the book. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see his working method in that respect that he, uh, he he's not so intent on what I write, you know, it's more the, the, the culture and the writing he wants to, to convey uh, of others. Uh, sometimes a little bit unscrupulously perhaps because the love affair he has with the woman he calls Suleika, uh, in, in fact, in the Divan, she writes five of the poems that, that were written by her and uh, he never acknowledges that, you know, he never, well, of course he really couldn't. I mean, he was having, she was a married woman and he, he was in love with, uh, but uh, she's now seen as one of the finest poet, woman poets and finest poets actually of the 19th century uh, on the basis of these five poems, which are so close to Goethe, although they're her own voice that, you know, he didn't at first realize that they were by her, you know, so, uh, but he incorporated them, he incorporated everything. <laughs> so that, I mean, that's a, I think that's an interesting turning point to talk about your roles as translators uh, and to move to your roles as as poets, right? There's a, you know, in being a conduit and, and finding a voice and incorporating the material that, that you were engaging with so powerfully. Um, so uh, I, I would really, uh, you know, Peter, I, I read, and you mentioned this before, that, that you've said in the past that at this point, when, when I'm writing a poem, I feel like I'm translating. And when I'm translating, yeah. I feel like I'm writing. Um, so could you say a little bit more about what, like, what do you, what do you mean by that? How, how is there so much slippage between, between these two things? Yeah, people tend to be a little skeptical of that. Um, and maybe I was myself when I first started translating. I worked very hard to keep them apart. This is translation. This is my own poetry. And, but that was, it was a kind of um, repression going on there because so much of what was making my poetry was that, go, to go back to my first, um, your first question, so much of what was making my poetry become my poetry was stuff that was trickling in through translation, kind of passive translation or loose translation. And when, as I began to not just acknowledge that, but embrace it, that's when things got really exciting, uh, both in terms of my own poetry and, and in terms of the translation. Um, the Andalusian Hebrew poetry, to go back to that, is in a way a translated poetry. The Hebrew is so much a translation of the idea of poetry, of Arabic poetry. Sometimes it's a direct translation, but rarely. Usually it's a more of a kind of concept translation or a calc, uh, uh, a kind of grave rubbing of the um, stone rubbing, tombstone rubbing of, of the prosodies and of the conventions and all of that. Um, and, and of course, this subsumption, the taking up of the biblical vocabulary and making it do all these new things. So there I was, translating a poetry that I realize is a kind of translated uh, translation itself. The original is a translation. And that gave me tremendous pleasure. Why, you know, that should be like the derivation of the derivation. That should just be watered down hogwash. But it was great and I loved it. And so that dynamic itself made me interested and, and became part of my poetics. So that I, be, I began to realize that is really what I'm doing all the time whether it's from inchoate experience, you're walking around and you have this internal, not even quite yet monologue, right? Just the registration of sensation and things other people are saying or what you're reading. We all know that. The distance from that to a poem is a translational distance. And this is not just me. I mean, this is, this is Mallarmé and this is Valerie and this is a lot of people have acknowledged that that everything is a kind of translation in that respect. And uh, as I say, embracing that was, I found tremendously um, liberating. Um, lately, in, in a, partly in an effort to almost test that, but the limits of that, I've been involved in a bunch of collaborations. So the, some of the works on the wall behind me, I've been working with different artists who've asked me to write 
about their their um, their work. And normally, I'm pretty also reluctant. The idea of ekphrastic poetry is not one. It usually comes with a certain staidness, a certain static quality. But what I wanted to do was could I could I translate the experience of the of the printing or of the drawing or the painting, not the subject matter. Could same thing. Could I get inside in the same way I want to get inside the poem that I'm translating from Hebrew or Arabic? Can I get inside the visual work? Or I'm doing this now with, with music also. Um, so I really do feel at this point uh, I. The, the tricky thing when you're writing your own poetry is to locate the original text. <laughs> where is the frame? Like, where is the text? Once you know what the original is, you've identified for yourself, ah, that's the original. Then it becomes, you know, you can, you can begin that translational process, so. Um, and, and where do your translations from Arabic fit in here? Because I know you've, you've translated uh, and worked very closely with Taha Muhammad Ali. Uh, how does, how does that? Oh, yeah, my Arabic came much later and probably a little too late. Um, I've I've uh, forgotten as much as I've learned just about, but um, but I still I still work with Arabic. I still work with medieval Arabic. It's just very slow. Uh, Taha, uh, I began to work with because of a mutual friend of mine and uh, Eric's uh, Gabriel Levin, who many people in the audience will know, and with a Palestinian friend Yehi Hijazi, and. Um, we ended up doing that book that you mentioned, So What? And I became extremely close. In some ways, I was the, the primary translator, also because I, I then had the Arabic. Um, I began studying Arabic in Jerusalem in part because of my, I was beginning to do the medieval Hebrew and realized that's another scandal <laughs> that I think I can do this without Arabic. And also, why would I want to do it without Arabic? And so much of what I was getting was from the Arabic side. So that was one thing. Secondly, I live in Musrara in Jerusalem. Uh, the first language I hear every morning pretty much is Arabic. And I realized that I was deaf and uh, blind to a lot of the city. It was, it was crazy. I'd gone to Spain, to Iberia, to look at all, you know, the Alhambra and all that stuff. But I wouldn't, in those days, I didn't, wouldn't go to East Jerusalem. And then one day, Dean and I, my wife and I were uh, walking down highway number one the, along the old city walls. And we ran into an old college friend of Adina's who was doing, working for, you know, voter democracy or kind of voters' rights in emerging democracies in Palestine. And, oh, Mark, how are you doing this and that? What are you doing? Oh, I live in East Jerusalem. And he said, come visit us. And I realized, wow, it's easier for me mentally. This was a long time ago, mind you, a long time ago. It's easier for me mentally to go to Iberia, to go to Spain, than it is to just pop across the highway in the evening and relax. Now, that, again, this was a different period. This is pre-Oslo and all that. But I felt I had to do something about it. So um, working, I got, you know, Adina and I became like family. Adina wrote this great biography about uh, Taha. It, it just, it rewired not so much my sense of Hebrew or my sense of English as what it meant for me to be in Jerusalem and to be a Jew who's very involved with the legacy of Hebrew poetry and cares deeply about it. And it's not a direct extension of the Andalusian ethos. I'm not that naive. Um, but, but there are ways in which, yes, the, there's a continuation there. Uh, and it was, it was a marvelous thing. Taha used to say uh, something, I don't understand how it is that this you know, Jewish man from America could get inside my blood. And because I feel his poems the same way I felt that Ibn Gabriel poem. But I would say, no, no, it's the opposite. How is it that this Palestinian guy who grew up in a basically a 19th century village um, could completely become the thing that I care most about as a poet for that period? Um, so it's just, it's, a, it's, all, it's all part of the continuum. It's the same continuum of writing and translation and, and being in the world and and understanding that you're involved with translational analogs all the time. Is, is there a poem that you've written uh, that reflects that kind of, that continuum that you just mentioned and that we've been talking about? So uh, every poem, I feel like every poem I've written, but uh, you and I <laughs> talked beforehand about, um, and in, in honor of the Persian dimension of the evening, I'll read um, a poem called the guzzle or ruzzle of, of what he sees um, 
which takes as its sort of trigger uh, something that uh, Josef Gicatila, Spanish Kabbalist, 13th century, wrote. And what he wrote, uh, translated into English, he wrote this in Hebrew, is if one asks, what is the depth of primordial being? The answer is nothing. So in Hebrew, ayin. Right? What is the depth of primordial being? The answer is nothing. This poem actually was written in Jerusalem, uh, in, in Musra. What he sees when he sees the wintered almond trees unfolding, white flames of nutrition's pistols through the blueness beckoning, is nothing without the minds holding it there in the day's crucible reckoning. And when he considers it, that thought too is nothing without the fed fire of the words burning into the black hole of knowing's nothing. It's all a matter of poise through pain or bliss in equilibrium. So words are uttered and sentences made, which are nothing but a pact arrived at, a living, a kind of suspension bridge across an infinitely wide magisterial rivers, flotsam flowing, cables strung and girders soaring as though its immeasurable mass and freight were nothing. And I pick that one because that the kind of massive, the, the fragility of language that, you know, we're doing, we're speaking now in this crazy web of connections all around the world. And I, I, I feel that all the time, There's, that every sentence, every word in some way is carrying that weight. And yet this massive, incredibly beautiful, problematic, potentially violent, about to collapse structure uh, is what makes everything possible. Um, and and that, that's sort of also what translation is. Right? It's impossible, but you, you, you create this thing and it does actually carry it. You mentioned the bridge at the beginning. I remember being in a taxi in Jerusalem once with a Palestinian driver and we were speaking in Arabic and about the things I do and he does and what he reads. And he said, you know, Habibi, you're the jisser, you're the bridge. And I said, yes, but the bridge is somebody whose back gets walked across all, all the time. Sometimes it's not the best thing. <laughs> but I also thought this poem because there's a, a passage in the Ikhwan Asafa, in the Epistles of the Brethren of Purity, which Eric has been translating, um, that speaks to this. And it's just from the notes in my Ibn Gabiro book. Uh, it goes and from the first book. And they have said in the books of wisdom, this world is a bridge cross over it into the world to come, or as Daniel Matt translates Kabbalistically, the world that is coming. Uh, for this world is a world of action. The world that is coming is a world of reward. Um, all that, I think, fits into everything we're saying. So. I mean, I, I also have to say, I like, I like the poem you just read because as you were reading it, it made me think of the process of composition itself, sort of this, uh, the the place of the place of language and the place of the voice in in the process of, of writing. Um, Eric, I, I want to ask you also what you know what is what is your process of writing a poem? You you've published poems widely, you've published a number of collections. Um, oh. and uh, does does the way that Peter describes it also speak to you or or do you approach that the task of, of composition and the task of poetry from a different angle? Well, I don't, to be honest, I don't really see myself as a translator. I mean, I'm a sort of an accidental translator. Uh, that wasn't my purpose. But when I'm writing poetry, it always begins with some little, I like to think of a little melody in my head. You know, there has to be some uh, musical um, impetus, which uh, spurs the poem. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it's it's very, very. It happens very quickly. Other times, it takes years, uh, and yet you have to cling to that musical uh, echo, you know, that's there, the original impulse. Uh, and again, for me, it's it's a very physical thing, as I think it is for Peter too. Uh, I remember, and I, I hope I don't sound like a name dropper, but when I studied with Shlomo Dov Goitain many years ago, we would translate a poem, and he would say. Let me taste that. He would smack his lips, you know. And <laughs> I thought it very quaint at the time, but I know exactly what he was about when he did that. You know, it was, 
it was something physical. It's like what Wallace Stevens says, one reads poetry with one's nerves. Uh, you know, it's a kind of, uh, maybe I emphasize that too much, but uh, uh, how much the translation has to do with it, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly it has an effect and an influence. I don't think it's as intimately um, connected with my work as it is for Peter, at least the way he describes it. Uh, but uh, certainly it's had an influence on me. Uh, the, uh, uh, mostly in terms of cadences, sound patterns, things of that sort. Uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to put you on the spot by any means, but is there, is there a poem that you've written that you think reflects that sort of the, the hmm. influence of those cadences? <laughs> Uh, let me think about that for a moment, okay? <laughs> we'll go on and I'll come, you come back. <laughs> okay. I, I think yeah. so, but I don't know that I would be able to, to prove it, you know. <laughs> um, Maybe there's a poem that Eric just wants to read. <laughs> it doesn't prove it. <laughs> there's a poem that you just want to read. Take the that. pressure off. <laughs> Is this pressure? <laughs> uh, well, let me see what I can... <clears throat> Well, while, while you're looking, um, uh, maybe Peter, I'll, sort of the, the direction that I feel like uh, I came to when thinking about how we were gonna, what we we're gonna do tonight and the conversation we we're gonna have is, the, is, is this question of teaching. Right? You've both worked as, as teachers, you've both worked as, uh, as instructors. And just before uh, our event started, we were having a little uh, you know, green room separate Zoom call uh, for a few minutes. And, and uh, Peter, you mentioned the, the pleasure that you have in, uh, uh, surprisingly, the pleasure you have in teaching through Zoom and engaging with students. Um, so I, I wanted to ask where those, uh, where those two functions overlap, uh, that of teacher uh, and that of poet or translator. Um, you know, from my own from my own experience, I know that many many scholars feel that teaching is a burden, uh, but my sense is that not that that's not your experience. Well, I mean, work is work. <laughs> it's uh, it's work, um, but I I do, and it's exhausting. I, I give it everything I have. I only teach one semester a year, which is which helps so that I actually can really focus on it. Um, I love teaching. I find it just in incredibly profound, almost a kind of lab for the, the kind of relational dynamics uh, we've been talking about that go into writing. Um, I learn a great deal, obviously. Um, I taught medieval Hebrew poetry this year to a group at Yale of mostly non-Jews, uh, uh, several uh, students of color, um, really taught it as uh, several Arabic speakers, several Muslims, um, it was Ramadan. Uh, it was as a kind of world literature. That was, that was really interesting for me to do that. I, it's not, usually I get there's more of a Jewish identity uh, quotient uh, involved too, and this there was none. Um, but the, the first what influence it has on writing is it gives you less time to do it. So that's why a lot of writers don't like to do it. Um, and, and the second complaint is that people have is that it takes the sort of charge that should go into your writing or could go into your writing goes into all that other transferential uh, relation to the student. And it does, but I, if, I feel that it's part of my ecosystem or the ecosystem of my poetics or the kind of poetics that matter to me. So there's a certain sacrifice, yes, but all that feeds back in to, um, to the kind of work I end up doing. And then when I go back to my writing and my translation, I go back to it with kind of more gusto and desire because I've, I've been held away from it. Um, but maybe Eric's found, uh, found a poem by now. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise- You know, I'll... one of the uh, principal themes in the uh, epistles of the Ikhwan uh, al-Safa that P Peter mentioned is the theme of the microcosm uh, which runs through it. And of course, it's a theme not only there, but in other uh, other literatures, not only Islamic, it goes back to ancient Persian, uh, 
teachings. And of course, you, uh, Sam, as a translator of your wonderful Bunda Hishan, uh, which you and Dr. Uh, Agostini have prepared, and which really I recommend to everyone, it's a wonderful, magnificent translation. Um, but I was also intrigued by the microcosm for my own part. I wrote a poem about it. Uh, microcosm. The proboscis of the drab gray flea is mirrored in the majesty of the elephant's articulated trunk. There's a sea in the bed mite's dim orbicular eye. Pinnacles crinkle when the mountain winged shy moth wakes up and stretches for the night. Katydids enact a richly patterned light of galaxies in their chirped and frangible notes. The smallest beings harbor a universe of telescoped similitudes. Even those rocky mountain goats mimic Alpha Centauri in rectangular irises of cinnabar splotched gold. Inert viruses replicate the static of red-shifted, still cathodic cosmoi. Terse as the listened brilliance of the pulsar's bloom, the violaceous mildew in the corner room proliferates in Mendelian exuberance. There are double stars in the eyes of cyclonic spuds shoveled and spaded up. The dance of Shiva is a cobble-souled affair. Hobnails at flapping slippers on the disreputable stair. Yggdrasils germinate on Walmart windowsills. <laughs> I don't know what you would make of that. <laughs> Can you can you, uh, can you say a few words about how you came to write it? This poem? Yeah. I was reading a lot about microcosm uh, in some Arabic literature. The great um, writer Al Jahiz talks about it, and of course the Ikhwan Safa, and it kind of appealed to me because uh, it was based on the intuition that the world is not a collection of disparate separate things, but a single organism in a, in a sense, you know, it's an old stoic idea that the world is a single animal. And uh, also I thought there was a certain humor in it, you know, uh, Al Jahiz talks about, you know, take a look at the flea. He has a trunk just like the elephant, you know, and you know, there's something, that, I mean, he obviously knew this was comical. I mean, he has a good sense of humor. Uh, one of the few Arabic writers of that period that does. Uh, and um, I don't know, it just seemed to me an interesting kind of thing to develop and uh, uh, with a kind of unusual vocabulary and uh, uh, some unusual sound effects. It's also the kind of translation I love. Right? That's a medieval poem in a way. Just <laughs> Thank you, that's a completely. <laughs> it's just completely. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I absolutely agree and I, and I I think Jahez's humor is uh, is maybe a good place to transition to questions from the audience. Uh, yeah. so thank you, thank you both for reading and for sharing and for your uh, insight. Um, so I'm I'm seeing uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, maybe uh, let's start with. Um, what's the name of the name? One second. Um, so let, maybe start with it. We'll start with a question, question from Liran, which is actually just the last one, and it's about misreading and misunderstanding. Um, could you please discuss one awkward case of a misreading or misunderstanding of a medieval poem from Hebrew, Arabic, or Persian by your students? In other words, what works? or does not work in teaching medieval poetry to English speakers. Eric, do you wanna go first? Or? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I have many <clears throat> amusing anecdotes about student translations and other, <laughs> um, uh, I don't know what we call them, gaffes, that would be cruel because I love my students. Um, but, um, well, I remember one essay which began about the introduction of Islam into Indonesia. And the, set, the essay began in this unforgettable way. The king fell asleep 
And he was surprised when he woke up to find that he had been circumcised. Uh, <laughs> I bet he was. <laughs> but as for actual mistakes in translation, I don't, I mean, I know there were, but I don't recall any particularly outstanding examples. That sounds like that could have been a translation mistake. He woke up surprised to find he had been surrounded. Yeah, I think that's what he meant. <laughs> Circumscribed, maybe. But <laughs> or there was the one who said uh, the Sufi saint died from a snack in the desert. You know, and of course she meant a snake, but uh, uh, I know those desert snacks, you know. I did when I was teaching high school in Jerusalem. I had a... Uh, a senior at uh, 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 the gymnasia, uh, Ruchavia, who turned in a paper called um, Anne's Frank Diary. That's a different level. It, and to, to answer the question, um, so one time uh, it was a student who was incredibly excited and, and reasonably articulate about uh, a poem by Ibn Gabi Roll, Open the Gates, My Soul, um, uh, and wrote about that um, for several interesting pages. And the uh, professor uh, turned, returned the paper and said, this is extremely interesting, but you've completely misunderstood that this is a liturgical poem and you thought it was a personal secular poem. That student was me. <laughs> my first, that first year at Hebrew University. And um, I, I just hadn't learned the modes yet, but I was inside the poem. I just didn't understand the rules of the game. But luckily enough, the guy said to me, he said, but you just keep going like that. You'll, you'll go far with this. And uh, whether that was ironic or not, I don't know. <laughs> um, there's, I, th I think we have time. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and I'm, it's a question from Marsha. Uh, and I'm going to read it and then sort of reframe it for us. So the, the question concerns uh, uh, exists. The only Arabic literature that I'm familiar with is the book The Prophet by Khalil uh, Gibran, which is popular in the 70s. Uh, so I think that for, for probably a good portion of people in the United States, certainly that's, that is the, the Arabic literature with which they're familiar. Um, uh, what's the next step for people? Where, where else should they go after becoming familiar with the prophet? How, do, how does someone who's unfamiliar and who only has access to the translations enter the world of Arabic letters? Is it me you're asking? I would, yeah. say, uh, I would say some of the modern Arabic novels uh, would be a good place to go. I think of the uh, Sudanese writer Toyeb Saleh, uh, his uh, season of migration to the north, which is, I think, one of the best things written in modern times in Arabic. Uh, and of course, there are many others. I mean, uh, Taha Hussein, uh, mm -hmm. anyway, you know, you know, the, you want a list of names. I mean, <laughs> but there, there, there actually are quite a few uh, well translated. Uh, modern Arabic novels, uh, and especially in women's novels, you know, which is not something you find in the classical tradition so much. Um, There's really a kind of explosion of good translation from Arabic now. Yeah. Um, it's just a completely different world out there than even than it was 30 years ago. Um, That's true. A, there's just a lot more of it and the quality is much uh, higher. Was the question just about modern, or was it? No, I think it, I think it's uh, the question relates to probably both modern and medieval, and and I would, for me personally, I would say that the the library of Arabic literature. Yes, is exactly I what I was going to say. Yeah. I was going to mention. Give a yeah. shout out to to them. That's a superb. Um, yeah. Yeah, and they're doing incredible stuff, and a lot of it. Um, my colleague Ayel Shaukat Turawa is very one of the directors of that. Um, James Montgomery. So James Montgomery just did this incredible volume of poems by Antara, yeah. pre-Islamic poet, but also poems from the whole legend of Antara, who was like the sort of the Romeo, uh, Antara and Abla, the Romeo and Juliet of Arabic literature. And um, I mean, I helped with that volume a little bit, wrote the forward, so I was very 
I know it very well. <coughs> but, and James worked with uh, Richard Seaberth, a really wonderful <laughs> translator. But that's a that's a knockout book. I mean, yeah. just terrific, terrific book. Um, and there are others, and there's the wonderful Hussein Hadawi's uh, versions of the Thousand Arabian Nights, two volumes from Norton. I like a lot. Um, you know, there, there's a lot. You know, you also just have the, to... trans, the translation of the Arabian Nights by Malcolm Lyons, uh, which I think is really the best modern translation. You know? mm -hmm. uh, in three volumes from Penguin. Oh. Yeah, you just have to follow your nose and let one thing lead you to another. And, and I think maybe maybe that's a good place for us to conclude with a, a list of books to read and, uh, and some homework for everyone. Uh, so I want to take this opportunity to thank you both profusely again. It's really been a pleasure uh to have you it's been a pleasure to speak with you and uh and thank you to our audience for for joining us uh for this evening and we look forward to seeing you at future events of the national library thank so, you sam thank, thank you eric supporting. and everybody out there bye -bye. I see some friends out there too so hello <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you bye good night i'll open microphone so people can say thank you personally and ask any more questions if there are any left Thank you very much for, to everybody for being here. Have a good night and we'll see you in our next event. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, um, I have a question, uh, uh, pedagogically. Um, in uh, teaching uh, poetry to your students, do you uh, incorporate as part of your method actually having them recite in the original? Uh, Stephen, I think uh, our speakers have actually left us at this point. Uh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> so if, you, if you put the chat question in the chat, we can uh, we can follow up with you on that. Thanks, everyone, again. Okay. Thank you. Bye. I will. <laughs>